gorgeous rainy morning. Man, I don't know about y'all, but my garden is exploding. It is like loving this rain that we've been getting lately. It's like there's so much stuff out there. The rabbits are loving it too. <laughs> Um, welcome, we are just so glad that we're all here to gather together this morning to um, worship and just hang out together. A um, couple of things, my name is Esther, if I haven't met you, I am on the uh, board of directors team here at Threads. Um, in the Church Center app, if you haven't downloaded that yet, there is some great information as well as the lyrics for this morning and um, contact information for the leadership team if you have questions or want to learn more about threats, um, that information is there. Um, also, there's hard copies of the lyrics and the weeklies for this morning out in what we call the front porch, just kind of an entryway out there. Um, inside the weekly is information about our next family meal, potluck. It's going to be in two weeks. Um, so if you are planning on joining us for that meal and participating in that, the information that you need is in the weekly. It's out on the front porch. Um, and also just another uh, couple of businessy type things. Um, for those of you that like to participate in our yearly weekly prayer gathering that happens during the week or the spiritual talk conversation that happens during the week, um, Rebecca's on vacation this week. So the prayer um, time on Tuesday is still happening. On, on Tuesday, um, but the spiritual talk gathering yeah, conversation is not happening on Wednesday. So just to make note in your calendar if you typically um, engage with those two things. So um, I think that's everything. So we're super excited to just continue to worship together um, in music and conversation. And so I'll turn it over to you. All right, good morning, everybody. Good to be back with you all and seeing you again. So before we go into worshiping for music, uh, let's uh, go into our first word today, which is out of Psalm 145, verses 17 through 21. And it says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. So let's, uh, let's go into a time of worshiping together for music. If you're able, let's stand up this morning as we just proclaim how great our God is. And this song we've done once before, it's a newer one. It's based right out of Psalm 145 that we just read from. So. Sorry. 
referring now to just to recognize you. Soul sometimes can be so overwhelming just to to be in your presence, to just think about everything that you are, that you are worthy, the King worthy to be praised, that you are God who oversees everything, that you are our Heavenly Father that loves us unconditionally. And sometimes just coming before you, it's like, what are the words do you say right now? And but we come before you to just give ourselves to you and give our hearts to you through these songs that we sing, through what we read from your word, the messages that we hear from Rebecca and other speakers here. And God, we just thank you that, that you are good. We thank you that we with us being in you, that we will never be shaken, no matter what. And we just thank you for who you are, and that you are here with us right now. We give the rest of this time to you today, and as we focus on you, we come together to just be able to be together in your presence. And we thank you again just for everything. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. And you can have a seat. Good morning. I would like to invite the kids that are here to come on up and chat with me for a second. I know you're here, but you have all disappeared. Oh, you guys are in the back, in the cafe area. You want to come on up here and chat with me for just a sec? And meanwhile, while I'm chatting with the kids, you want to hand these out to the adults. Thank you. Well, how are you guys today? Good. Good. You can have a seat for a second. We won't take long, but it's more comfortable to sit, huh? Um, well, I'm glad you guys are here. I enjoy my chance to chat with you every week. It's nice to have a second just to chat with you guys. So, you know, this summer, the adults have been talking about um, being gentle and how God is gentle with us and how God asks us to be gentle people. Do you guys like it when people are gentle with you? Yes. Yeah. And today, the grown-ups in here are going to be talking especially about gentle speech or gentle words. Have you, have you ever had somebody speak to you harshly or roughly in a way that's not gentle? How does that feel? Not good, right? How does it feel when people speak to you gently and calmly and like lovingly? Good. Much better, yeah. And you know what I was thinking about is that we all kind of talk to ourselves a lot of times too, not like out loud, but in our minds. Do you ever make a mistake and say to yourself something like, what is wrong with me? Or like say like kind of mean things to yourself, like I'm so dumb, why do I always do that dumb thing? Do you ever do that? No, I hope not, but some of us find ourselves doing that sometimes. I do that sometimes, or I, I say kind of harsh things to myself in my mind. And I was thinking that what I wanted to say to you guys this morning is that, did you know that God, that the Holy Spirit, who is one of the three persons of God, one of the three persons of the Trinity, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts all of the time? And that the Holy Spirit's voice never sounds like that. Did you know that? Yeah. The Holy Spirit's voice in our hearts is gentle and hopeful and loves us more than we can imagine. So that's what I wanted to say to you guys this morning. That if you ever find yourselves kind of talking to yourselves and saying, what is wrong with me? But I'm so dumb. 
that you can say to yourselves, that is not the voice of God. Can you guys say that out loud for a second? Can you say, that is not the voice of God? That's not the voice of God. Yeah, and when you find yourself hearing things like that in your hearts, do you think you could maybe turn to Jesus in your heart and say, Jesus, will you speak to me through your Holy Spirit the gentle words that build me up and don't tear me down? Do you think that's something that you can turn to God and say if you're ever finding yourself saying harsh things to yourself? Or if other people say harsh things to you and it hurts your heart, you can turn to the Holy Spirit and say, I need your gentle words for me right now because that, that hurt my heart when that person was harsh with me. So I just wanted to remind you that God is there for you and God is speaking gentle words to your heart. So sometimes it's good to just quiet down our minds for a minute and listen to what gentle things the Holy Spirit might be saying to us. All right, I want to pray for you guys real quick. And then is there KC today? I know there is. Okay. All right. So let's pray. Then you guys can head, head to KC, okay? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that your voice is always a voice that builds up and that affirms that we are loved and cherished and that you made us exactly the way we are on purpose. And Lord, I pray for these kids today that they would know that deep in their hearts through the power of your spirit. And that when they um, find themselves saying harsh things to themselves or if other people say harsh things to them, that they would immediately recognize that is not how the Holy Spirit speaks. And that they would turn to you and search for your voice that is loving and that builds up. And I pray that you bless them as they go to KC today, that they would grow in friendship with each other that they would be great listeners and that they would learn from your Holy Spirit as they um, spend some time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for chatting, guys. Hi. <laughs> jump right in here and hopefully you each have a handout that has all of our passages for this morning and some quotes and so forth since during the summer we're typically meeting outdoors and so when we're indoors because of the weather we don't we haven't prepared slides so the handouts come in come in handy that way so today was going to be our outreach Sunday and I'm sure I'm glad that we postponed it because this would have been this would not have been a fun, water fun day. <laughs> it's cold and miserable, and uh, I think that was that was the right call, clearly. So, um, because though today was not going to be a regular gathering, um, I hadn't planned a talk for today, and so I'm excited that I was able to insert this talk into the plan. As, as kind of a bonus because as we've been talking about um, gentleness over the course of the summer, one thing that I think is super valuable to spend some time looking at is the power of gentle speech and how in God's word we are called to be people who are characterized by gentleness, which is so often expressed through speech. So this morning we're going to look at that in particular through the lens of Proverbs 15. I don't know if any of you saw my post on the Threads page, my nerdy post, earlier this week where I showed my um, translation work. So I started this week with the Hebrew and, and did my own translation work here. And so I'm actually going to read the passage um, my own translation of the passage, but if that feels a little too out there for anybody, I did print the NIV also on the printout. But we're gonna uh, we're gonna look at it. Sometimes it's nice to have words that are a little bit fresh too. This this is a fairly well known passage, and so um, it's I think helpful to play with the language a little bit. Um, and I still stuck quite close. I mean, this is a, a pretty literal translation um, that I have here. So Proverbs 15 verses 1 through 4. A gentle answer turns back rage, 
but anger bubbles up at a hurtful word. A wise tongue beautifies knowledge, but an insolent mouth allows foolishness to flow freely. In all places the eyes of God keep watch over the evil and the good. A healing tongue is a tree of life, but where there is perversity of the tongue, there is a broken spirit. So we've looked at this topic of gentleness from a number of different angles this summer. But one thing that we have not done, actually, is kind of succinctly define the word <laughs> gentleness. So I want to do that a second. Merriam-Webster's definition primarily defines gentleness in terms of what it isn't. Uh, according to Webster, to be gentle is to be free from harshness, sternness, or violence. And then if you look up other definitions, they include the words kind, soft, and tender. No surprises there, right? And of course, we all long to be treated gently. And gentleness between humans, or the lack thereof, is most often expressed through speech, through the tongue, as the poet of the Proverbs writes. Our words are immensely powerful. Our ability as human beings to shape reality through speech is one of the main ways that we demonstrate the truth that we were made in the image of God. It's significant that in the ancient creation stories of scripture, uh, you know, God created everything by speaking it into existence. Right at the foundation of all Jewish and therefore Christian belief, is this assertion that, um, that there's just stunning creative power in the Word of God. God's Word created everything that exists. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then in the Gospel of John, Jesus is called the Word. So in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So in our scriptures, speaking is directly and profoundly linked to creating. God spoke, and all matter came into being, and then God sent God's incarnate word, in the person of Jesus, and new creation was inaugurated. So the words of God's tongue spoke us into being at the moment of creation, and then Christ, the living word, spoke wholeness, healing, forgiveness, redemption, new creation into us. And we, as divine image bearers, also wield tremendous power through our words. And so the words of this ancient proverb ring true. A gentle answer turns back rage. A wise tongue beautifies knowledge. And a healing tongue is a tree of life. So I'd like for us to take a few minutes and look more closely at verse 4 here, where the poet says, A healing tongue is a tree of life. So most of us here are probably familiar with the image of the tree of life from the Garden of Eden uh, in the creation story from the beginning of the book of Genesis. We read that there were many pleasant trees in the Garden of Eden, trees laden with delicious and nourishing fruit. And at the center of this idyllic orchard were two particular trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the story goes that Adam and Eve uh, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even though that was the one tree in the entire, entire garden that they had been instructed not to eat from. And, and their rebellion there got the ball rolling 
for sin and death and harm and hurt and destruction to enter into creation. So that's what we have come to call the fall with a capital F. Humanity as a whole fell out of perfect harmony with God and with each other and into the realm of sin and death. So immediately after the fall, God says in Genesis 3, 22 through 24, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim, and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. So the tree of life here is depicted as the source of eternal embodied life. And it seems really significant. Um, I mean, it seems like it would have been a really significant thing in the Hebrew imagination, right? Like, especially in light of the way we modern Americans, I feel like, are very taken and pre preoccupied with this notion of eternal life to the degree that a lot of Christianity has kind of boiled down to, like, how to go to heaven when you die. Right? So this idea of obtaining eternal life is a big deal. So you'd think that scripture would make a really big deal out of this tree of life, that it would be a whole motif. So I think it's really fascinating that the tree of life is never mentioned again in all of Hebrew scripture except for three times in Proverbs, where it is linked directly to the pursuit of of wisdom in some way and then in this passage the um one of my i've said this many times one of my favorite old testament scholars ellen davis um, in regard to proverbs use of the tree of life image says this the inference would seem to be that wise speaking points the way back to eden more than any other sphere of human activity, speaking has the potential to affect healing at the deepest level. It is a tree of life. It restores us to the condition of harmony with God in our fellow creatures for which, uh, for which we were made. Speaking has the potential to affect healing at the deepest level. Intuitively, I think most of us probably know that to be true. And I heard a great illustration of this reality in one of my favorite podcasts recently. This is um, Kate Bowler's podcast, Everything Happens. And she was interviewing um, an author, or another podcaster actually. And this person told the story of two people named George and Lisa. So Lisa was a young professional, and when she was a kid, her her parents had gotten divorced, I think, when she was really young. Her dad wasn't perfect for life. And I think when she was in about middle school, her mom remarried, got married to George, who became her stepdad. And um, Lisa and George just didn't have a good relationship. They didn't get along well. Lisa didn't like George. She looked for opportunities to be away from home so as not to have to be around him. He wasn't a bad guy, but she just didn't like him. They just didn't gel. And um, as Lisa grew into adulthood, her relationship with George just stayed distant and, um, and cool. And the relationship just didn't matter very much to Lisa. However, things became kind of complicated when Lisa's mother developed Alzheimer's. And uh, suddenly, George was Lisa's primary contact in, um, you know, approaching her mother, being involved with her mother. So Lisa now had to decide things like, when I travel to the city that my mom and George live in, do I stay at George's house, even though my mom isn't there, she's at this care facility, do I stay with George to go visit my mom? Or it just got weird and awkward because they just didn't have a very good relationship. George just suddenly had become a much more significant part of her life. 
Meanwhile, this was during the Trump presidency. George was from rural Michigan and had worked in a tool and die factory um, his whole career. And Lisa, on the other hand, was a young professional who lived and worked in the San Francisco Bay Area. Their respective demographics correctly indicated their political <laughs> allegiances. And Lisa felt a great deal of stress about this when it came to relating to George. It just felt like a chasm between them. Oops. But one day, when Lisa went to visit her mom um, and was sitting with George, and they had been having to interact a lot more over recent months, George turned to Lisa and said to her, I just want to say to you that I care about our relationship more than I care about politics. And that was truly a turning point in their relationship. It was this moment where George chose to transcend the thing that threatened to divide them and to muster up the courage to speak his heart, to let her know in this very overt way that he cared about her and that she was even more important to him than other things that were important to him. So from that point, their relationship grew a lot closer. Lisa ended up spending time at George's home when she would go to visit. And George would turn Fox News off when she came, and they would watch Family Feud together. And it got to the point where it was something they could even joke about, where she, as she was leaving the house, she would say, you can turn Fox News back on now. They got to a point where they could even talk openly and honestly about their political differences, not through debate, but from a point of curiosity. They were safe enough with each other that they could try to understand what it was like to sort of see the world through each other's eyes. When Lisa's mom passed away, she found tremendous in her relationship with George, as they were both people who uniquely missed and remembered her mom. A healing tongue is a tree of life. George wasn't a poet. He didn't have the best words. He didn't need to be eloquent. It was just his courage in turning toward his stepdaughter and allowing her to see his heart through his speech and to kind of open up some of the content of his heart for her um, that, that caused healing. It brought new life. It created a new reality between them. It pointed back to Eden or forward to the new creation, to the connectedness and fellowship we all long for. And also, as I was working on this talk and thinking about this topic, Joel and I watched, um, just finished last night, the series um, The Bear. Have any of you watched that? It is some pretty awesome television. <laughs> um, really, really pretty breathtaking. Um, and it was fascinating to watch that, thinking about this element of healing speech, because at the beginning of every episode, it says, rated mature for language. Like, usually there's a host of things, like why something is rated mature. That was just language, language, language. I mean, it's just like a rough and tumble restaurant world, and there's just tons of language, like not healing language. But actually, this show has some beautiful, and I no spoilers here, but it just has some beautiful examples of a of a word, of a few words, creating a new reality, a healing reality. So if you watch it, watch for that. It's really, it's, been, it's pretty powerful. So I'd like to pause for a couple minutes and have us just turn toward each other in groups of three or four and encourage you to group up with maybe somebody you didn't drive here with. <laughs> and, um, just would love if, if we want to take a few minutes and share about a time when someone spoke something to you that was a healing word. And 
that can be very broadly imagined. Just something that someone really saw you and spoke, something affirming or something healing that um, created some new reality for you or between the two of you in your relationship. Um, it might be a moment where you felt like you deserved a harsh word and received grace and kindness instead. Um, it might be a time when someone just provided comfort in a way that was really meaningful. So uh, again, lots of different ways that could be interpreted, but just let's take a couple minutes so that each, each person in your group, group of, I don't know, yeah, three or four, um, gets a chance to, to share a brief anecdote. All right, go ahead and then I'll, <laughs> I'll call us back together in a minute.
Do okay. I need to speak up nice and loud? And, yeah. Or, okay. <laughs> um, so I worked in a pharmacy in my early 20s, and uh, the pharmacist there was a man in his 40s, and he, uh, it was a really rough time in my life, but he became kind of a mentor to me. Uh, and he, we liked a lot of music, but also like he and I had different politics, but he was one of those first people that was able to kind of talk with me about it in a gentle way because some of my views were a little harsh. But um, anytime we'd have a customer come up to the pharmacy that was kind of rude, I would, it would really make my blood boil. And so there were times I'm kind of embarrassed. I would come around behind, there was a spot where like there was a kind of a half wall up that I could go behind and I would literally like pound on the, on the table if I was so mad. And there was a day where some very rude people came up and were really nasty to me and they demanded this thing or whatever and I came back and I, so in my anger I had their, their prescription for a drug that you would need to have a hard copy of and I just threw it at this little partial wall. Well then it happened to slide down behind the wall behind this like desk area to a spot where there was literally no way to get it out <laughs> unless you were to separate that wall from the floor. And then I came back around and they're like, we want our prescription, we're leaving. And I had to look at my boss and be like, um, I don't know how to get it out. And so he ended up handling this pretty sensitive information and collaborated with another pharmacist at a different location to get these people who were very upset taken care of. And then when he came back around, he just put his arm on my shoulder and just said, Keith, when you're angry, you have to do better. Like, and he wasn't mad, he didn't discipline me, I did not get in trouble for that, but like, I just remember feeling so ashamed of my behavior. But rather than digging into that shame to kind of motivate me to change, he was like, you gotta do better. And he said it kindly, and I think that I still struggle with getting angry and knowing what to do with when I'm angry, but that, that helped me a lot. Anytime somebody angry or nasty would talk to me, I can handle this without slamming my fist down and getting super rage you know, with them. And so that was kind of a helpful turning point for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing. That's such a great example. Because we'll, you know, we'll get to this a little bit in a minute, but gentle speech isn't always painless, right? Like it's a little painful to be told you need to do better. Uh, but there is a way to speak truth um, that calls better out from us, and that's just a fantastic example of that. All right, got to find my spot now. So, uh, so hopefully, just hearing each other's stories and kind of having to think through some of our own stories of receiving gentle speech helps kind of remind us of some of the ways speech has created new realities for us in our lives. I want to read this quote from Frederick Buechner. I have it in your handout as well. But he says, in Hebrew, the term devar means both word and deed. Thus, to say something is to do something. I love you. I hate you. I forgive you. I am afraid of you. Who knows what such words do? But whatever it is, it can never be undone. Something that lay hidden in the heart is irrevocably released through speech into time, is given substance and tossed like a stone into the pool of history where the concentric rings lap out endlessly. Words are power, essentially the power of creation. By my words, I both discover and create who I am. By my words, I elicit a word from you. Through our conversations, we create each other. So new realities are created through our words. And this fits with our self-understanding as people of the risen Christ. We've been called uh, fellow workers with God in 1 Corinthians 3.9. And Paul, in 2 Corinthians 5, um, you know, talks about the fact that we are a new creation. Um, I'll read the passage. Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. 
And this always, whenever I read this passage, it brings me back to my dad preaching when I was a girl, because my dad loves the Greek, spends a lot of time in the Greek. And so I always remember him saying, the Greek here just says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation, which packs a punch that I think we miss when we sort of make it a, a complete sentence. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So all this stuff, the message of reconciliation, healing works, the tree of life, new realities created with words, this is all connected. And when we grow as a people who know to the very depth of our being the magnificence of God's healing word to us in the person of Christ, the word made flesh, what will flow out from us? Healing, reconciliation, gentle, loving, courageous speech, that creates a new reality between ourselves and others, just as God has created a new reality in our own hearts. And like I briefly mentioned in relation to Keith's story, um, healing gentle speech is not only about the absence of harshness. It can be, it's not harsh, but it can be bold speech. And um, it takes a lot of courage. It means turning to each other, really seeing each other, speaking our hearts, um, saying the affirming things that might feel a little risky or a little bit embarrassing. Uh, sometimes saying hard things that rock the boat in order to create some new possibilities. Christ-like gentle speech isn't some kind of like milk toast benign flow of soft-spoken platitudes. We're talking about speech that is courageous and mature, wise, sometimes hard to hear, sometimes hard to say, for the sake of creating new possibilities, new realities, for the purpose of health and healing and wholeness. So, Proverbs 15.4 again says, a healing tongue is a tree of life, but where there is perversity of the tongue, there is a broken spirit. Now, most translations smooth out this line a little bit, and I even smoothed it out there a little in my translation. Um, the NIV says a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. That's a pretty standard translation. But the Hebrew leaves a lot more ambiguity. The Hebrew simply says, but perversion in it, meaning the tongue, but perversion, perversion in it, a break in the spirit. That's the literal Hebrew. And of course it makes sense that translators would lean into the idea of those who receive harsh words have their spirits broken or crushed, and that makes sense. But another interpretation is possible here, and that is this. When our tongues are not instruments of healing, when our speech does not point back to Eden, and even more so point forward to the new creation by bringing life, then something is amiss in our own spirits. Perhaps when I am not deeply rooted in the message of reconciliation that Christ, that God has spoken over us in Christ, then my tongue becomes an instrument of harm rather than of gentleness and healing. If we are tempted toward harsh speech, uh, if our tongues reveal some violence that is lurking in our hearts, if our speech is not consistently characterized by grace, then let us seek a healing word for our own spirits. In 2 Corinthians 
1, Paul says in verses 3 through 4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So if our words aren't gentle, if they don't comfort others, then we need to return to the source of our own comfort and healing. We can't comfort others if we haven't received God's comfort for our own spirits. I recently um, listened to an interview, I, for, I forgot to look up the name, but it's this woman, she's the author of a book called Try Softer, and she said, we repeat what we don't repair. And that was really striking to me. So if you've been on the receiving end of harsh or stern or violent speech, even if it was many years ago, even if it was in your childhood, attend to that. Invite the Holy Spirit to bring healing. Come chat with me as your pastor and seek counseling and care for your own soul so that you can experience healing and repair so that you don't repeat those patterns so that you can be empowered to offer to others the gentle and healing speech that you needed and didn't receive and this is possible this healing is possible through the power of the risen christ God can work as mightily through good, hard work in the context of professional counseling as God can work through miraculous healing. And we can seek both. So we're going to transition now to share communion together. And I'll pray before we enter that time. But as we prepare to come to the table to partake of the bread and the juice together as a tangible reminder of Jesus' body broken for us, and Jesus' blood shed for us. I want to return to the line from our passage this morning that we kind of skipped over. It's this verse 3 that seems sort of out of place in the middle of these four verses of Proverbs 15, where it says, In all places the eyes of God keep watch over the evil and the good. Doesn't it seem a little bit out of context? There are these three verses that talk about speech, and then plop, right in there, this thing about the eyes of God. So then I find it really fascinating that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, another sort of central gentleness passage, Paul says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So somehow, this idea of being characterized by gentleness, being a people of healing speech, is directly connected to God's nearness. And this is good news for us. As we eat this bread and drink this juice, may we be reminded that Jesus entered fully into the whole reality of very non-gentle, non-healing, human experience in all of its brutality and violence, sneering, mocking, lying, harshness, all of the ugly speech and accompanying action that humans can muster. And Jesus took all of this upon himself so that we can say, the Lord is near. So that we might receive healing and enter into gentleness and partake of the tree of life. The tree that Revelation chapter 22 tells us will straddle the river flowing out of the New Jerusalem with healing in its leaves for all the nations. The Lord is near. Healing is at hand. May we partake and be transformed. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful that through you, we can be people who live gently, 
who pursue um, becoming people of healing speech and know that that is empowered by you, that you have modeled that for us, that you've made it possible for us. In a world that tells us that doesn't work, in a world that tells us that we have to beat the world in its own game, Lord, you brought a new reality into play through your word, God, in the person of Jesus. So Lord, I pray right now for healing for those of us here who have been wounded by words. All of us, that's true of all of us in some way or another, but Lord, for some of us that's been um, real significant trauma. And I just ask through the power of your spirit that you would bring a new degree of healing, that you would bring a new degree of awareness of words that have lodged themselves like fiery darts of the evil one, and that you would um, walk alongside your loved ones here, Lord, to do whatever uh, healing work is necessary to uh, to be able to uh, sort of have the poison removed from those words. And Lord, I pray that we would be a people who um, who do find repair and don't repeat the hurt um, with which we have been hurt, but that we would be a people whose gentleness is evident to all because we know that you are near. And we just, we thank you again and again and again for the depth and richness of your word and for this encouraging um, bit of scripture here this morning. And so I pray that you would meet each of us as we come to the table. Jesus, that you would um, be very present to each of us in the bread and the juice, and that we would encounter you um, in a healing and restorative way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You can come to the table whenever you're ready. The um, regular bread is here. This is gluten-free and dairy-free bread, and the juice is there. And uh, Willis will lead in worship as we take communion.
was speaking. I didn't even notice it. Well, I'm just going to speak a closing benediction, and then we'll be done. And this, um, gosh, <laughs> this is Paul, but I, um, I accidentally left out chapter and verse, so you can do your own investigative work <laughs> to remember where I pulled this from. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>